Okay, I might as well give you the BB-84 uh, protocol. Um, this is how quantum cryptography, and like I say, it's key exchange, actually works. Um, now, as I say, um, this currently in the commercial versions, you need you know, a dedicated single mode fiber optic cable. You're, mm, but there are um, experimental versions of it. I remember talking to a banker uh, in Singapore, and he was uh, discussing research that they were doing to do uh, quantum cryptography with uh, cell phones, so that your cell phone <coughs> um, could negotiate a, a connection with a bank machine and uh, therefore secure the transactions um, in uh, additional ways. Uh, the Chinese have um, uh, experimented with um, uh, communication from satellites uh, using quantum cryptography. And, uh, of course, in both cases, this is not, you know, dedicated single-mode fiber optic cable. This is free space. Uh, and certainly the uh, satellite experiment is definitely free space. Um, the, uh, the idea is so very elegant and um, gives us, you know, in, in terms of the, the theory... Um, an additional uh, level of protection, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. But, as is always the case, the devil's in the details. The, the implementation is the problem. And, as we say, you know, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. Um, and so, quantum cryptography... Uh, I, I know that some people think that it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but it, uh, you know, it, it has problems. And, and it's not that it can't work, but uh, its uses are going to be limited. Um, so, what do we do? Well, we got Alice and Bob, um, as usual. Uh, and Alice, on her end of the cable, fires... Photons, photons being quantum entities, um, you can uh, sort of force a, a value on them. Um, and uh, let's just say it's um, uh, polarization for the moment. And, and we can polarize... Well, we can polarize in a variety of ways, but let's just say that we will polarize either straight up and down or at a 45 degree angle. Um, so there's two different ways of polarization. And of course, for each type of polarization, we can polarize it um, up or down. And, and so we can get a value of zero or one. So we can impose the polarization on the photons with both a value and an orientation. And this is important. Now, at the other end, Bob is trying to receive these photons. He is trying to read, with the correct polarization, the value that the photons have. At Alice's end, Alice randomly chooses a value for each photon and an orientation. At the other end, Bob randomly chooses a detector, and the detector has to have the correct polarization. So he randomly chooses a polarization to get the value, and he records the values of the photons he receives. Now, both of them are... Uh, generating, uh, well, um, uh, imposing the polarization, the orientation of the polarization at random. So half the time, 
Bob is going to choose the wrong polarization, roughly. Um, obviously, we're going to, you know, do this many, many times in order to, to get a key. Um, and we're going to do it twice as many times as we think we need because we're going to have to throw half of the data away. So, um, once the photons have been sent, then Bob sends to Alice the orientation that he used for the detector. Alice compares that against her record of the polarization orientation that she imposed on the photons and tells, it sends back a message telling Bob which ones are correct or which ones are wrong. You know, whichever one uh, you do. Well, you can, you can send both. You know, this is correct, that's wrong. Um, Bob then throws away, as I say, you know, roughly half of the data that he's got, but he's still left with a key. Now, all of this is done in the open. It's, it's like the asymmetric encryption. Um, we are allowing for the fact that somebody may be eavesdropping. If somebody is eavesdropping, they are randomly placing a detector in the line and recording what they see. Um, that then gives them some data. But, of course, again, it's, it's random. So half of the data that the eavesdropper, which we generally call Eve, is trying to uh, collect is going to be incorrect. And so Eve is only going to get half of the information that she needs to build the key. Um, even if we assume that Eve has half the information for the key, uh, you know, we just double the length of the key that we think we need so that it, you know, makes the key even longer in terms of Eve uh, doing a brute force attack on it with, for the, the remaining bits. So we've, we've got this um, uh, done. Now, the thing is, um, that, you know, this is sort of like the asymmetric encryption. They, um, Alice and Bob can agree on a key that they are using. Eve can see everything and still doesn't have enough information to get that key. Uh, but the thing is that when she places, when Eve places a detector on the line, if it's wrong, there's a 50% chance that the detector is in fact going to flip the orientation of the photon and the, the polarization. So then as Alice and Bob start to try to communicate, they realize that something is wrong in here. And I mean, you know, we can, we can build in Hamming code, we can build in, you know, lots of things to try and detect what the error is. But for the first time, eavesdropping is not a passive attack. Eavesdropping is normally just listening, and you don't know that somebody is eavesdropping on the line. With quantum cryptography, you can know there is a change that can happen. Now, unfortunately, and this is where the implementation comes in, because of the error detection and correction that we have to use for the commercial systems, there are all kinds of attacks that we can, in fact, mount on these systems. And, and so they, you know, it, very elegant, detects eavesdropping, it's wonderful, it works perfectly, except that it doesn't work perfectly because quantum uh, systems 
have noise, have a problem with noise, we have to have error detection because of that error detection, we don't have 100% protection like we should.